I've got Dennis Isbister on the podcast today from the TV show Wild Fish, Wild Places. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. We are headed to uh, Pyramid Lake with one lucky winner as part of the fly fishing giveaway uh, that's ending pretty soon here. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway to enter for a chance at a trip to Pyramid Lake and some other great products we're giving away to some other lucky winners. Uh, be great to uh, to see in the in the big giveaway. Uh, today, Dennis breaks down Pyramid Lake and his life growing up uh, in one of the big destination trips in the West and how he produced a TV show that's almost 12 years old and still going strong. We hear about the story of how Pyramid Lake was revived by uh, one of the biologists out there who used genetics uh, from a long-lost um, population. And now some 20-plus uh, cutthroat trout are being uh, caught up there. It's pretty amazing. Find out why they use ladders, what the popcorn beetle is all about, and, um, and why and how they chum up cutthroat in a boat. So without further ado, here is Dennis Isbister from Wild Fish, Wild Places. How's it going, Dennis? Good, buddy. Good. How are you? Good. Good to, good to be uh, recording here. This is... Uh, this is going to be a fun one. We're going to dig into uh, the the greatness of Pyramid Lake and all the amazing stuff that uh, is going on out there. Uh, a little bit on the giveaway and, and, and your you know your background and stuff, but uh, maybe you can just start there. Just tell us about uh, you know Wild Fish Wild Places is a TV show that's been going on for quite a number of years. Can you talk about how you first got into fly fishing and then how how you got into a TV show? Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh been doing it 12 years now yeah, wild fish wild wow. place has been on air for 12 years which is crazy to me but um yeah i was uh, i was in the construction world for most of my life before that as a contractor and uh you know everything crashed as we all know uh, back in the day in 08 and uh 07 and had uh you know we all got our lives turned around some way or another and i decided that i was gonna drop everything and start a fishing tv show which was a lot more difficult than I ever had realized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did, did you just, uh, you're kind of thinking, well, we'll just press uh, record and then we'll post some, some videos or what were you thinking? I mean, what, no, what was your background I, before that? So I had, I, I had done some work in the hunting and the waterfowl hunting end of things. Uh, and it kind of started there. So I had a little bit of a relationship with some guys that were successful, a guy that was successful on that end of it. Um, I'd done some filming, waterfowl hunting, and um, I, I was I felt good on camera, and I had the connections, and I thought that there was a, a, something missing in the fishing world, um, you know, the, like what we do, you know, the tri- the, mm-hmm. the travel, the adventure, the uh, maybe the kind of the crazy fish along with what we do. And I just kind of, I basically sold everything I owned, hmm. moved into an old house that I grew up in and remodeled it and drove a 1998 Mercury Tracer around for a few <laughs> years and nice. paid for. And, uh, yeah, borrowed a bunch of money because the deal with outdoor television is you got to have the airtime before you can oh. drag anybody in. And it was tough, man. It was a tough go to start with, honestly. It was, huh. uh, you know, I literally had potential sponsors tell me to get the f out of their booth at wow. icast because it, times were so tough and they had already fired many people that they were already working with and yeah it was a struggle man huh. it was uh five six years of really just you know nothing um you know a little bit here a little bit there just enough to keep the show going and anyway um huh. they built up some great relationships at this point now and things are better and and uh, now it's a you know, it's going great. Yeah. How did you, I mean, there's so much to, I mean, that's an amazing story. First of all, I, I love the, I ask the questions a lot on here. I've had a lot of successful people and, you know, and, and I always love to hear that question, you know, of, you know, did you, when did you know you were, you were all in and you, <laughs> you jumped off, right? I mean, you totally, in, in, after this crash, you just jumped in and went for it. Yeah. You know, I tried a little bit, um, to do a little bit of construction, um, I tried a little bit still, yeah. but it's in business. I believe 
it's one of those things. Um, you don't dabble. You don't t- touch your toe, you know, mm-hmm. dip your toe in the water to see what's going to happen. You're either all in or you're all out. And that's yep. just the way I've always done th- done stuff. And that's what I did. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to go all in on this. And I'm either going to, you know, crash and burn or we're going to come out the other side still rolling. Yep. Yeah, that, that is cool. Yeah, so you jump in at the uh, the bottom when there's no money. It's amazing, right? Because you go <laughs> yeah. in there, so you go into something that's probably even more challenging than what you were in, but you were passionate about it, right? Now, with fishing, can you talk about – so where did you grow up? Uh, Nevada, yeah, I'm from northern Nevada, a little town called Fallon. I was born and raised, and you know, that's where all my businesses are now, and, uh-huh. and uh, yeah, out here in northern Nevada that's in the it. desert. That's it. And obviously Pyramid yeah. Lake is uh, – how, how far is Pyramid Lake from your hometown? Pyramid's about an hour. Yeah, yeah. So right there. So jump in the car. It's right here. Hop over. That's amazing. So, okay. Yeah. Well, well, we're going to we're gonna dig into to Pyramid for sure. Um, yeah, I just want to touch a little bit more on that, you know, your show. So you, you get in there. And did you have, like, fishing-wise, you, you jump into it. Did you know anybody in the industry? How, how did all that work? So I did know some people in the industry, a few. Um, I knew a few reps. Um, a few guys in the rep business, um, you know, a handful of people here and there that would lead me to some introductions, which, you know, helped a little bit. But, uh, what I learned down the road was those were, those guys were going to be my, they were going to be my lead ins to a lot of these places. And once I got my feet under me and, you know, when we were putting out good content and we're starting to crush it for other sponsors and people, you know, these guys would be the ones that, you know, take me by the hand basically and walk me right up to the guy that can make a decision and say, you need to talk to this guy. And that's what it takes in any business, right? There's a, there's always a whole bunch of minions that can tell you no, and there's only one guy that can tell you yes, and you you need to find out who that one person is. Yeah, that's awesome. So basically you found some of those people, and now you've built a bunch of relationships and You've got some, right? Spon- I mean, sponsors, is that a big part of the TV game? I mean, you have to have sponsors to, you know, I mean, you got to get the money for uh, someone, It's the right? only part. That's it. Yeah, it's the only part of the TV game yeah. um, is um, your relationships with these companies, these manufacturers. And, you know, I've added on that and, and, you know, been owners of my own manufacturing and part owner and blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, sponsorship's the, the deal. You have to pay um, for your airtime, you know, you have to pay for your commercials. You have to pay for, you know, production and travel and all that stuff. And all that comes out of your sponsorship budget. And so, yeah, building strong relationships with these manufacturers and, you know, sponsors and building them stuff that is useful to them yeah. and working harder than everybody else. They're getting, it's amazing. I mean, they, those, these guys get 10 emails a day. Oh, I know. Of I know. People looking to hitting them up and looking for yep. money and stuff from them, and and uh, yeah, yep. you got to make sure that they don't ever forget about you. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear it. I, I know all the sponsor game. I mean, I've it's definitely takes some time. You know, it's, it, I think it is all about building those relationships because those people, you know, if they don't know you from anywhere, you know, it's like <laughs> you know that's not a good place to to ask ask for something, right? You got to you got to build. Right. So it takes time. Yep. Yeah. So let, let's dig, you know, Wild Fish, Wild Places. Can you, the, the TV show, I've watched a little bit of it. I, I could tell what it, you know, what I feel like. I mean, it's a pretty amazing show. What, what can you describe it to somebody who's never watched it before? Yeah. If it's, if you've never seen Wild Fish, Wild Places, it is, um, it's a fun TV show. It's, it's a lot of interaction with people. It's culture. We do a lot of travel on the show, hence the name. Um, you know, we try to add some really crazy exotic species and travel into part of our season as well as the backyard type fisheries, the part of the season. So yeah, if you've never seen it before, um, you can go to Amazon prime, uh, and watch wild fish, wild plays world fishing network, the newest contents there. And we're getting ready to launch a YouTube channel coming up here pretty soon. But, uh, if you go and and look for those shows, you're going to see vampire fish from the hmm. jungles of Colombia, I mean, you know, Pyara, the Pyara are one of the coolest fish you'll ever see, uh, big dagger teeth and, hmm. you know, big, big trips up into this jungle, uh, camping on the river, peacock bass in the Amazon, swimming with the piranhas, nice. uh, spotlighting caimans at night, um, you know, just this, just this kind of crazy stuff. And that's just what I love to do. And, 
And, uh, you know, you see all the other stuff too, Alaska fly fishing. We do a lot of Alaska fly fishing and wading and, you know, going toe to toes with the bears and, um, you know, big lake trout up north and big pike, and, uh, walleye, you know, we, we do a lot of different stuff. I try to mm-hmm. never, ever do bass. If I can never do a largemouth bass episode. Oh, no, really? Okay. No, no largemouth bass. <laughs> <laughs> now, not that they got anything against largemouth bass. I love, everybody loves catching some largemouth bass. Yeah. It's just part of the, it's just been so overdone. And that's one of the reasons why I came up with Wild Fish, Wild Places. And what it was uh, is at that time, it was like every other show, or more than that, 80, 90% of the shows were bass fishing shows yeah. and the other and the hunting shows 80 percent of them were whitetail hunting shows it's like you know we gotta yep. put something out there for the rest of the people in the world you know? <laughs> totally are there other uh now i mean you spend 12 years which is amazing i mean 12 years just seems like such a huge chunk of time you know it's, yeah. it's cool to hear that um are there other tv shows now doing uh like what you're doing pretty much with the you know the fly i mean you do fly fishing and do you do both cover both yeah a lot we do a lot of both and that's you know I've been fly fishing since I was eight years old. I love to fly fish, but I equally love trolling and I equally love casting and I equally love every aspect of fishing. I truly, truly just love fishing. Um, and there's, um, and so we add all of that to the show. Um, you know, fly fishing is such a small portion of the overall, um, fishing world. It's crazy. You know, we love fly fishing and, you know, we, connect with fly fishermen and et cetera, et cetera. But I think in the grand scheme of things, it's like two or three oh, percent. Yeah. Tiny. Um, so yeah, we, we do, we tie it all in and do, and do everything. But like, say, say that, um, you know, that Pyara show that we did, you'll see both in the same episode, you know, we'll be yeah. chucking big streamers for them oh, and cool. throwing big jerk baits or something too. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's cool. I think that, um, you know, I think the people that I've interviewed on here, some of the best guests I've had, including like Kelly Gallup and people, you know, there are people that always mention just that. They say they love, you know, the conventional fishing. You know, they love talking to people and it's a great way to learn and get better at fly fishing. And I think fly fishing is, so ha- has had a stigma in the past of, you know, this, this uppity, you know, I'm a fly fisher. Right. And I think the more people that realize that it's just fishing, I think it, it, I think it's better, right? It's better for that person. I think it's better for the fly fishing industry too, you know? Plus, not Absolutely. to mention your marketing, right? You're, you're getting a bigger audience, so that's that's a big thing. You're right, and that's what we talk to people about all the time. Um, the you know the most important thing for us is fly fishing lovers is to get more people into fly fishing. Exactly. You know, unfortunately, I mean, we it's one of those double edged sword things. But the way to get more people into fly fishing is to not be snobby and you know, address that, you know, try to help people get into fly fishing and be nice to, them. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, there was a stigma. You're right. And we see it still at, yeah. at certain shows and stuff. It's out there. And we preach on the show all the time. We talk about it. Yeah. It's just another way to catch a fish fly fishing or whatever you're doing. It's another tool in your toolbox. That's what you, you should learn how to do it all because Kelly was, is absolutely right. If you, understand those fish on a different level mm-hmm. whatever it might be you're going to be a better fly fisherman and, and my buddy austin and i talk about it all the time at pyramid specifically which we're going to be talking about here soon mm-hmm. well i fish the i fish out of my boat more than i fish off a ladder at pyramid but i guess what when i find fish out of my boat in spots we'll be the first one to get to fish them off a ladder <laughs> because nobody else knows they're there yet no oh, that's cool that's cool. And that's because Pyramid Lake is, yeah, maybe you can describe it because Pyramid Lake's kind of, is it, there's certain ends of the lake that are always changing and like with sandbars and stuff. Is that, is that the way it works? Well, a little bit, not so much as the, as the sandbars and stuff changing. Um, that does happen a little bit here and there, you know, the bottom will etch out a little bit yeah. or some, you know, we had some flash floods a few years ago that changed a lot. Um, but we've just generally had a lot of water in the last three four years and the water is at historic levels right now so that's kind of changing historically the game. high the fish historically high yeah it's uh it's changing a lot um you know the, the water is up it, to a level which i've never seen in my lifetime wow and it's a it's an actual lake and it's a caustic uh terminal lake which means there's inflow from the truckee river but no outflow 
which means the only way that the water leaves is through evaporation, which makes it alkaline, salty, oh, uh, yeah. which is why the Lahontan cutthroat is the fish that lives there. Um, they are adapted to oh, wow. living in those, sort, those sorts of conditions uh, when other fish won't live in there. Gotcha. So, yeah, it's interesting. And that's the Lahontan cutthroat trout, which, um, yeah, I mean, I talked to uh, Brian, you know, obviously Brian uh, with Got Fishing, he's kind of our partner in this giveaway, which we'll talk about as well uh, a little bit later on. Um, but, yeah, he was noting that that same thing as well. So it's it's interesting. There's the Lahontans and, you know, I fish for them a little bit, a lot, a lot of the smaller ones. And where we're talking about, Pyramid gets some fish. Can you talk about the size? And Because you get fish over 20 pounds there, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, so a, a little backstory here. In fact, I fished it yesterday. Oh, cool. And my uncle and I fished it yesterday, testing some new plugs and some different things. And and we were laughing because when I was a, a you know, a kid and even a young adult, we would work our butts off and fight the waves and all that stuff for little, you know, mm-hmm. little, uh, you know, little Lahan cutthroats that were, you know, 18 to 20 inches, you know, if you caught a five nice. pounder, you were, which is nice. 18, yeah, 20 is, is still nice, right? Yeah, it's still nice. And, uh, we've gotten spoiled. And so kind of a quick backstory there, what happened. So years and years ago, um, and now that the state actually was the, took, you know, had the lake and w- was in charge of the fisheries and stuff. And they put a lot of different fish in there to see what it would take because the Lahontan cutthroat basically went extinct out of there. Hmm. Um, and then when the tribe took it back over, they got rid of all the stuff that was in there, started putting Summit Lake strain of Lahontan cutthroats in there. And they're a big red fish. Uh, they grow very slow. They they love cold water. They don't grow very fast. There's, um, you know, there's a lot of different biology and stuff there. Mm-hmm. And about 10 years ago, uh, they introduced a new strain, which they found at a place called Pilot Peak, Nevada. And they kind of assumed that when they were starting to go extinct, some guys, you know, they plant them all over, all over the place. And they ended up with this strain of Lahontan cutthroat that was almost identical. They, they cross-checked it with an old mount at the museum at UNR. And they, it's a, I, almost identical to that mount. Hmm. So they started breeding these fish for this leg and what they ended up with was this pilot peak strain that is growing on average a half an inch a month and they they've got a they've got a different attitude they they <laughs> they don't mind the warm water they are super active all the time they have a little bit different shaped head for eating more like eating minnows bigger teeth uh, a, a different, like a bullet shaped head instead of a longer snout, like the summits do. And they just tear things up and they are, uh, and they're getting huge. And so, you know, part, part of these fish that are getting really big are the summits as well. Um, they've been planting, if I'm correct, a co- uh, you know, half and half still half oh, okay. summits, half pilots. And, um, so the summits are getting big too, but yeah, that's kind of what's going on here. And now, like we caught a seven and an eight pounder yesterday. We didn't even take a picture of it. No kidding. You know, yeah. I mean, we didn't catch anything bigger, but <laughs> you know, we're getting spoiled. You know, we caught a seven pounder and an eight pounder back to back. I was like, oh yeah, it's a nice fish. Let it off and yeah, you know, at the God. side of the boat. That's amazing. And, I mean, there's twenty pounders. You know, there's eighteen to twenty pounders every day getting caught out there every day. Wow, that, and that's what's cool. I think that's why it's such a destination. Is that you know, for you guys, you're getting tired of the seven pounders, but for some people, that that's their a trout of a lifetime. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I have to remember that a lot of times. You know, I donate a lot of trips to charity and different things. And and uh, you know, we took some Boy Scout kids out there a couple years ago. And first fish they bring in, it's probably the smallest fish I had on my line all year. Honestly, I mean, it was. You know, 18 inches, 16 inches. It's just a, a tiny little fish comes flopping in. And I about out of my mouth says, I was just going to flip him off like, oh, that's tiny. And this kid loses his mind. It's the biggest fish he's ever caught in his life. You know, and so I have to, you know, make sure I I check myself a lot because, you know, like you said, those those fish that we're releasing at the side of the boat are most, a lot of people's fish of a lifetime, you know, trout especially. Yeah, totally. 
So let's 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 start there. So if you can, you know, talk. So we got a little bit of background of the the fish, the biology. There's these monster, freaking crazy, twenty pound plus fish. Um, but if you take us back before that to say, you know, kind of the the Native Americans or just wherever you want to go, but go back in history and give us a, more of a big, broader perspective on the lake and like there, the, what Lake Lahontan, right, was the original name of the the lake. Well, yeah, it, it was. Uh ancient lake lahan was like you know the dinosaur oh okay so okay it was way back there but yeah gotcha the little history of pyramid lake when uh in 1864 i believe john fremont was exploring uh this end of the world and he came across pyramid lake uh from the north and as he dropped in it was in january there was snow on the ground a thick layer of fog. He actually thought that he had reached the ocean. Uh, and so him and his team actually made his way, made their way around the east side of the lake, which is unbelievably brutal and <laughs> rugged. And uh, they got down to the pyramid and they had, they encountered Indians as they were going along. These mm -hmm. uh, Native Americans had had their, you know, their caves and all their stuff. And they get down to the pyramid and he documented the natives were feeding him these giant trout <laughs> that, in their opinion, was better than the salmon that they were eating up in Oregon. Yeah. And so what happened was this discovery led to the silver rush of Nevada, um, it, you know, roundabout. So the silver rush happened in Nevada. Everybody knew these giant, giant fish were in this lake. They actually built a railroad uh, down to the down and around the lake that led up to uh, Virginia City to feed the miners. So they commercially hmm. fished this lake for a long time, um, taking these fish up to the mining camps. And Fred Crosby, whose family actually owned the lodge on the lake, um, his grandpa commercially fished the lake in the in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he what he used to do he used to get in a rowboat and he'd have a big a big line like a chalk line uh a weight and a spinner a big basically like a giant panther martin if you will <laughs> and he would row his boat and he would try to find like scum lines out in the lake and row his big boat and that's how he would commercially fish the lake to send to the miners <laughs> hmm. no kidding so yeah and so eventually what happened was the the lake we put dams on the Truckee river oh right um and we commercially fished the thing basically to extinction yep yep that's it which now you heard the stories before that about how the fish are getting giant it is one of the greatest um biology success stories mm -hmm. Uh, in recent history, we are actually taking down some of the diversion dams um, and putting a fish ladder in there, still allowing to have the dam to divert water because we still need water in those areas. But we're allowing the fish to move up river now. And they documented um, 1,500, I think 1,500 fish mm -hmm. spawning in the river last year. Nice. Nice. That is an awesome success story. And, you know, I'm, I'm really excited at this, you know, again, this giveaway we're doing, I'm going to be meeting up with you and, you know, and Brian in the winner of the, the contest, on, you know, up there. I've, I've never been there. It's, it's pretty amazing. So I'm, I'm jacked to see because it's, yeah. pretty, it's pretty beautiful too. Isn't this the natural uh, area? Pretty amazing. It is beautiful. It's an amazing place. It is unlike anything else you, you've ever fished before. It, you know, you get on ladders and you know you stand, you stand there, and the weather can be terrible or it can be beautiful, and it's beautiful high desert, and you know it's um, it is a lot of fun. I tell you yeah. what, there people you can see why people get hooked on it, and uh, yeah, it's a really good time. And then when you guys come out too, we'll take the boat and I'll take you to the other side of the lake where you know nobody else can access unless you have a boat. So uh -huh. be pretty cool. Nice. Nice. And yeah, maybe we can dig into that on the ladders. What, what is the, you know, so when you go, you know, when you go there, is everybody just bringing their ladder and throwing it? What, and what is the ladder all about? Can you talk about the fishing and how that all works? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So it kind of started with milk crates a long time ago. Uh, and, and guys would take milk crates just so they could get a little bit higher out of the water. Cause it's cold, you know, when you're fishing out here right now, it's, it's cold. So you get out of the water a little bit, you're able to cast a little better. You stay a little warmer. Well, that kind of um, led to ladders, you know, six-foot mm -hmm. construction ladders or step stools. And now um, we have 
like some super badass, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like aluminum A frame stands with a stand, you know, a casting platform and a, a seat, wow. like a boat seat on them. And so <laughs> you're working a ledge. There's a, when I teach seminars and stuff, uh, I refer to like a, the, the primary and the secondary ledge that runs around the whole lake. There's a ledge that starts, you know, anywhere from five to eight, 10 feet and goes out to 20 feet. Um, and, and depending on where you're at in the lake, there's a shelf in between the two. And early in the morning, late in the evening, or when the weather gets bad, those fish move right in tight to that primary ledge, that first ledge. And that's kind of where you position those ladders and you're fishing that first ledge right there. And, um, you know, a lot of guys are running, you know, indicators, bobbers, um, balance leeches, big coronamids that are specific for this lake. Um, and then the other thing is stripping. You know, a lot of guys strip uh, popcorn beetles and oh, yeah. these different flies that are specific for Pyramid Lake. And there's a you know a specific line and a specific way that you strip them. The, just like anywhere else you go, you know, it all changes. Yeah, so. gotcha, gotcha. And what – so if somebody wanted to buy one of those super comfortable captain's chair ladders, where would they get one? You know what? I don't know, honestly. I know you used to be able to get them um, at – crosby lodge uh they sold it this last year so i don't know if he's still carrying pyramid lake lodge is still carrying them in uh the store or not but that would be the place that i would check okay. there and then i think you might be able to get them like at um sportsman's warehouse too in oh Rio, yeah. maybe gotcha yeah they might have a guy making them there's a handful of guys around that make them yeah they make them okay i'll, I'll put a link in the show notes i'll track one down and, and throw that in there so people can check them out so if you're going there and like so if we were going there and what is the is there a um you know best time of the year can you take us through the seasons there when you would fish or when you'd say if somebody had one chance to go there when they would when they should go yeah for sure so you know the beginning of the season uh, it's been a little different the last couple of years uh, which it opens in October. Uh, it closes July, August, September. Uh, opens back up in October. Um, if you know, it's uh, the fish are usually a little deep, uh, chasing schooled up to each other. Um, you know, coming up and whacking bait in the mornings and the evenings, and then kind of laying back down. So fly fishing specifically, if you're going to go in October, um, make sure you have a tube with you, so you okay. know, something to get out there a little ways. Um, November, it turns over at some point, as soon as we get a first cold snap, it turns over and the fish immediately move shallow. Uh, you know, in the boat, we'll be running plugs in like, you know, six to 12 feet of water. The fish, the fly fishermen will be starting to whack them off the ladders. That's when Brian and I caught, and I caught a 15 and a half pounder with Brian. Um, you know, that was right. Those first couple of weeks, it turns over, uh, guys will fly fish out of a boat, kind of starting to key into that a little bit. Hmm. Uh, you've seen a little bit more of that. There was some guys uh, when we were filming out there, uh, out of the boat. We were trolling plugs. These guys were uh, anchored, you know, with an electric mm -hmm. fly fishing, and he landed an 18 pounder. When we were right there. Nice. You know, we had a we had a 16, and we had a 20 plus to the boat that day. So, huh. um, if you can time it right when it turns over, that's a great time to be there. A lot of people get here. A lot of people travel here in April. Uh, March and April. That's a really big time for the fly guys to be here. They're mm -hmm. booked out in the lodge almost exclusively. Um, and and it, that, it's a really good time to be here. Yeah, so. yeah. And that's because March and April, you get out of the, it's not as super cold and nasty and the fishing's still good. Or, I mean, could with the yeah, fishing be good in January? To, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's good. It's good all year. It just kind of depends. Um, so I, in my opinion, um, and this is the kind of the fishing that we have fly fishing that I've experienced, you know, obviously there's other people that say it different, but this time of year that December, January into February, you're probably going to, if you spend some time, you're going to catch a big fish, like, mm. but it's probably not going to be big number types of days, okay. right? You're going to be, you're fishing for two or three fish a day yep. type of thing. But, you know, one of them is going to be big. Yeah. You're going to get, you're one of those fish that takes down your bobber or, or takes your fly is going to be a big, big fish. So that's kind of the trade off. You go into March and April, um, it starts to get to be numbers, you know, and, and you're still obviously got big fish roaming around too. Yeah. Um, you just start catching more fish, and then you go into May and June. 
Um, and May and June are kind of a sleep, the sleeper months for me. A lot of people give up after they start spawning and, and they leave. And for me, that, that's when I fish out of the boat a lot. Um, and you can fly fish out of the boat a lot that time of year. But, you know, out of the boat, we're catching 7,500 fish days with, you know, every day every day we're catching you know something in that 14 to 18 pound range every day you know you're mm. not even taking pictures of 10 pounders anymore yep um and it's epic and you there's ways that you can throw streamers out of the boat that time of year too um or uh, you know a pontoon boat in the right spots and guys are still catching them off ladders too so mm-hmm. um that's kind of it just changes a little bit i see you know? i see so basically is it is it that the water temperature as it continues to warm up fish get more active or why are they you know later in the spring is it post post spawn oh okay yeah. yeah they go into the you know pre-spawn is march april may you know april's the spawn and you know they get stupid and crazy and they're doing their stuff you can still catch a lot of fish in april close you know they come in right into the bank uh, in April and then they do their thing and they move back into the lake and post spawn they are eating everything in sight everything oh they, right there you go <laughs> they're just chasing bait and the bait schooled up pretty huh. heavy I mean we'll we'll sit on a school running tubes you know tube jigs and um, you know you'll you'll have 100 fish days no problem no kidding what yeah. you know if we stay on the um, you know, on the fly fishing side. So if somebody was listening to this, they, they'd probably be interested in, in, you know, trying to hit the fly, you know, with the flies. What is there, you know, I mean, what would you recommend for somebody going out there? Is it definitely, you need, you need a ladder to do it. If say they were, yeah. you do. Yeah. If you're going, if you're going to fly fish out there and you're going to, going to go over there for the first time, you definitely need a, a handful of things that are specific to pyramid lake, uh, warm, warm waders, <laughs> with boots, um, lots of layers, obviously, um, a ladder, you know, you can get by with a six foot, six foot construction ladder. No problem. Uh, it's a little bit less comfortable for sure than, than the, uh, the platforms that we use, yep. but you could definitely get by with it. Um, you need an eight weight floating line, uh, and indicators floor carbon, you know, 18, 20 pound floor carbon. And then I would also suggest the correct sinking line, which the, most guys are using a full sink with like a teeny, mm-hmm. you know, sinking line with the, you know, the amnesia backing or whatever it is that sinks. I don't fish that a lot myself because yeah. um, if I am throwing, you know, streamer stuff, I'm usually out of a boat throwing like a striper line. But if you're fishing off the bank, research that a little bit, but get a full sink line. But the key is if you're stripping bugs on the bottom, that you're running a mono leader in my this is my opinion and and i know some guys a lot of the guys out there will agree but a mono leader so it floats a little bit and you're going to be wanting to run uh the beetles popcorn beetles like chartreuse they make a beetle fly for that lake Mm -hmm. specifically called the popcorn beetle Mm -hmm. um and it is a like a chartreuse chenille uh with a white foam back and a little lip on it with a tail um, and, and it kind of wiggles almost like a little flat fish. And what you do is you, you run about a three foot leader off of the, right off the end of your line. So it's only sitting a few inches off the bottom and you pop it three times. Boom, 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 hmm. pause, boom, 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 pause. You gotta, that's yep. probably the most important thing. So there you go. So basically you're just, it's so like you said, you find that channel. The best thing would be when they come into that channel between the, the ledges and they're sitting in there and you can cast to them and you just basically let your full singing line just drop to the bottom. And is it, is it a sandy bottom yep. or is it, what, what's the bottom? Yep. It's almost all sand, yeah. um, along those spots that you're running that, you know, there's some stuff, the stuff that I target, you know, coming up here pretty soon. Um, I will start targeting some rocky areas cause the midges and you know, those coronamids fish well there, but they, they start keying in the rocks for a couple months now for some reason, you know, they're in the sand a little bit too, but, um, you know, they make it, they transition around the lake, you know, they know where the food's at. And, and, uh, so if you're in those rocky areas, obviously the, the bobber and the balance leech or bobber and a coronamid is going to be the ticket. Yeah, I got you. Okay, so yeah, that's the where are the different techniques. So you do have the time with the full sinking line is great, where it's not going to get snagged up, and you can drop it down to the bottom and and pop right. it. But a lot a lot of times, yeah, if you're in those sna- more snaggy areas, rocky, you're going to do a, a bobber and, and balance leech or something like that. Yep, indicator. exactly. Yep, indicator. Yep. Indi- 
You no, know, it's a bobber. I know. <laughs> That's the, I love it. It's definitely a bobber. Yeah, it's it's a bobber. Uh, so, and, and what do you for you? So, what do you think when you just you're out? You go out there to fish. I mean, you you do both, but do you say? I mean, percentage wise, do you fish more uh, more on your boat doing plugs, or do you more do more yeah. fly fishing, or? I do more. I do more pyramid lake fishing out of my boat. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, you know we will fly fish out of my boat for sure, but. I just enjoy Pyramid Lake uh, fishing out of my boat, you know, running plugs or, um, you know, jigs. We we do a lot of, uh, like, tubes and swim, you know, swim bait, swim jig techniques. Um, but, yeah, we there's a time of the year, though, too, where, uh, if you can believe it, we actually decoy fish May and June to the back of the boat. We actually run a string of flashers fish flash mm-hmm. spoons with no hooks on them in the prop wash as we're going about two and a half miles an hour and those fish actually decoy to the back of the boat and then we throw big streamers in right in front of their face and strip strip and they just come over and eat it oh wow yep. it's unbelievable and most people the shake their head they're like what, what's wrong with you <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's cool so so if somebody you know here listening to this probably they probably want to try to get one on a fly and say for this let's talk about this giveaway what would that look like to them you know if if, if they're gonna get, get into this giveaway are we gonna get a chance to put them on on a fly you know on a fly on a on a fish or what, what, oh, what yeah. is that no yeah. no doubt like and i say the majority of my time is out of a boat but i still fish it more than the average person off of a ladder and a fly rod. Oh, okay, yeah. I fish, you know, I fish the, I fish the lake, you know, 60, 70 days a year. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I still fish and yeah, absolutely. You know, most guys that love fly fishing, they want to come over they want to stand on a ladder and they want to see what this is all about. Cause it is a unique fishery. I mean, yeah. there is no place else in the world where no. you can do this and get on a ladder and you see a bunch of people lined up. So yeah, yep. uh, this giveaway is going to be awesome because we are going to have the winner come over. And we're going to have it dialed before they get here. And we're going to all go out and have, you know, get on a ladder and have some fun and really figure out, you know, figure out the fishery. They can, you know, they can do whatever they want. But if, you know, if the weather is good and it looks good, we might even be able to jump in the boat and go to the other side of the lake and fly fish it as well, which doesn't get to happen very often. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, and yeah, and we'll let the winner, uh, whoever wins the, to make a decision on, you yeah, know, when they want to go and all that, and we can talk to them about it. And yeah, yeah. So this is cool. So yeah, I mean, definitely the ladder thing. I mean, I think, you know, just for me thinking of, I think it'd be cool. Yeah. You go there, the ladder, and it seems like guys, you wonder why hasn't the ladder picked up in other lakes around the world, right? Because right. is this the unique lake for some reason that no other lake is like it? Yeah. I mean, somewhat, but, um, you know, when we were at Jurassic Lake, you know, down in Argentina, they, it's very, very similar style and there's a couple places that we fish monster bay being one of them where it would be perfect mm-hmm. you know you could get a ladder out there it'd be wonderful <laughs> there you go there you go you should start promoting the uh your, your ladder selling them for jurassic yeah. lakes uh, <laughs> guide trips yeah <laughs> cool uh so yeah so i guess uh, you know anything else about the actual fishing let's let's just think somebody was going over there on their own they they weren't hooking up with this this giveaway they're just going to fish it what any other tips or you know the, it sounds like the rod is kind of a seven to, to nine weight sort of thing it, and long you know the 10 footers for the indicator stuff that i use actually that's what i use the jurassic too mm-hmm. so i mean that's always a good idea but if you got an eight weight you know regular eight weight no problem you'll be fine um, I think a, a couple good tips would be to talk to the local fly shop, go to the, you know, the Reno fly shop or call the Reno fly shop. They're great at giving out information mm-hmm. and maybe go hook up with a guide one day, you know, yep. go out with Mike Anderson from there. He's a wonderful guy and super knowledgeable. He's on fish every day out there. So, you know, um, maybe go with the guide one day, kind of get the lowdown, get the rigging set up. Cause just like we talked about very specific, there's stuff that, um, is going to you know sometimes change change the game but if not at least talk to the renal fly shop and see you know get a get a report and see what's going on yeah yeah no it's always a good tip i think the the getting the guide for at least one day is a, is a definitely a good uh, a good thing to do so okay yeah. uh, well we'll i'll put some links uh, some you know in the show notes to some of the the reno shop and some other things any other um, you know when you think about resources any other things you know people can 
watch or read or anything that can get them ready for pyramid to learn about i mean the the balanced leech thing is i mean some people might not even know anything about it any tips on that yeah that's actually kind of a newer thing i wrote an article for california fly fishing magazine um a few years back when it was brand new so it is Hmm. relatively a new concept and so the balance the balance leech is basically a 90 degree jig hook uh, tied with the sewing needle at the beginning out the front of it to get it to where it you know it hangs it hangs in the water like a like a bait fish instead of vertical you know it yeah. hangs like it's supposed to and it looks natural in the water and um you know they've i fish balance leeches a lot of places in fact jurassic that's basically all we fished hmm. when we went down there the last time is balance leeches yep. they they do great so yeah look into some balance leeches um you know how to where to get them they got them all, all at the fly shop and yeah. you know the local places around but yeah um there's a lot of info out there now as everybody knows you know the yeah. internet's full of good stuff pay attention to you know pay attention to where you're supposed to go um and the the rules and regulations out there when you come to pyramid it's tribal land not state so you don't need a state fishing license that's a good tip mm-hmm. uh you just need a tribal pass a, a permit a fishing permit um, if you're going to camp, you need a camping permit. If you're going to boat, you need a boating permit. What tribe is it? What, what What's the tribe out there? Uh, Paiute. Paiute oh. Shoshone. Paiute Shoshone. Tribe. Okay, yep. cool. Cool. And, and Right. So they're in half, the, or not half, but a chunk of the lake is actually off, you know, it's only tribal land? Yeah. So the whole, all of it's tribal, and there's one section in the middle at Sutcliffe where the, the lodge is that is has been annexed in. Um, and the Pyramid Lake Lodge owns that and the accommodations there. So those are good people to talk to if you're going out there to stay. If you're going to camp, um, obviously check the regulations. If you're going to stay with the Pyramid Lake Lodge, get in line, <laughs> get it there ahead of time. Uh, but Reno's not too far away either. You know, Reno and Fernley are 30 minutes away. It's not a bad place to stay either one of those. Um, but the what's off limits you you just got to check it out the whole east side of the lake is off limits um and since the big flood that we had a few years back there's a a few other places a couple other beaches that are off limits now too okay and you mentioned i think a couple times but if if somebody was coming up there there people can camp i mean do people camp out there as well yeah yeah there's there's camps out there a lot there's a lot of really nice areas to camp actually beautiful beautiful camping obviously depends on the time of year but yep uh when i went out there yesterday there were some guys just set up with tents right on the beach where they were fly fishing there you go yeah so there's that and then and the lodge or what would be so the winner of this i i think um maybe it's not a lodge isn't the the be- the correct word but we're going to put them up i think in a place right on the lake is that at- yeah it's yeah yeah at the lodge at the pyramid lake lodge and yeah, it's uh you know they've got double wides and you know camp trailers and then one place that we try to get when we do things like this the big uh, three bedroom two bath house with the wrap around deck and barbecue and you know it's just up above the lake and yeah it'll it's it'll be sweet. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm just thinking back again, you know, to getting prepared for the trip. So if we're heading there, thinking about fly fishing, we're going to have a, you know, eight weight, whatever, 10 foot and, you know, a dry. It depends on what you're doing, but it sounds like here you're going to bring a little bit of everything because they could be balanced leeches. They could be, uh, are you doing coronamids and stuff like that? Or is it mostly balanced leeches or stripping? Stripping flies? A little bit of both. So the balanced leeches and the stripping was working about the same um, you know, a month or so ago, I'm not quite sure. I, I think what's happening now is they're, they're changing. Uh, they're moving to the coronamid diet. I think mm-hmm. now, um, you know, balance leeches in the morning. And then as it warms up a little bit, the coronamids and they are specific, uh, they're huge compared to the, what you're used to fishing as a stillwater fisherman. So get the albino wino and the right coronamids that are made for pyramid lake and they okay. have them at the lodge there yep. uh, specifically tied as, as well as the stripping the stuff you need for stripping they have if you're coming here to strip and that's what you want to do you're going to want a popcorn beetle or a booby fly oh yeah you know, the, the booby the, the, the phil roley fly which is uh i had phil roley on in a previous episode i'll put a link to that show which was awesome phil's kind of like the rock star of still water so um so that would be awesome good. yeah yeah, yeah he, the, the his uh if he's the booby fly guy well he's the man because those things have been crushing it too. he is yeah and he, it's such a beautiful <laughs> action those things you know yep yeah it kind of it's a fly basically it, it kind of floats right a little bit right right and that's what these fish you know these fish even 
most of the time when I'm fishing them with plugs or jigs or whatever, we're relating to the bottom all the time. We're bouncing things off the bottom. We're dragging things off, yeah. bottom, you know, whatever the case may be. So and that's where the, the stripping those bugs come into play. You, you, and that's why you use a short leader. Yeah. Uh, and that's why you use, you know, the foam booby or the beetle. Uh, that's you cool. know, you're just a couple inches off the bottom. Do you know, uh, do you know Phil Roy? You heard of him? I haven't. No. Yeah. Yeah. You got to check him out. He's, um, he's up in Canada. I didn't know about him either when I started the podcast a few years back and, um, I heard about him through another guest I had on and yeah, he's, um, I mean, he is the still water guru. He's written, I mean, a ton of stuff and Brian Chan is the guy that I actually heard about. It's like him and Brian Chan are these still water guys up in Canada. But yeah, that's his balance leech. He was part of the, he was part of developing the balance, balance leech and, um, the booby fly and his chronomid. Um, he's got a really popular chronomid as well. Um, I'll put a link to some of that stuff, but yeah, I think it would be, you know, it'd be kind of cool. I'm sure he's fish pyramid. I mean, I, I would be surprised if he hasn't, but it would be full, uh, cool to get filled down to pyramid to fish with him. Cool. I, I'm not sure if we can do it on this giveaway, but I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to him and, and check because I think, you know, to have that guy on, you know what I mean? To, to, you definitely learn some oh, stuff. What a great, yeah, what a great uh, resource to have. I mean, I'm sure that guy's got incredible wisdom on that kind of stuff. Yeah, totally. I'll, I'll check in for sure. Yeah, see if he's fish pyramid. Um, if he hasn't, I'm sure he'd be excited to get down. But um, okay, so we've covered a little bit. We've covered, you know, kind of the, the 222 I talk about on this show, the top two tips, top two flies, top two resources. You've talked a lot about the good flies. What about, you know, tips wise? Is Are there any just general thinking fly fishing? You're out there on a ladder. Any tips that you would recommend for somebody who, you know, help them get their first fish out there? Uh, yeah, uh, persistence for, for fly mm-hmm. fishing out here. And um, you know, our boy Brian from got fishing the first time I brought him out here, he actually stuck with it longer than anybody and was rewarded with a, you know, 12 pound fish. So yeah, stick with it. Persistence. Those, those fish move in and out of those ledges quick. Um, you know, the other thing is too, that has helped me over the years is, is thinking outside the box a little bit. Um, so if things turn off and the traditional things aren't working, you know, don't be afraid to, to, throw something stupid out there you know i've Mm -hmm. thrown some big twister tailed jig head like striper flies out there and started catching fish when nobody else was so a couple tips uh, i would say you know be persistent you know don't quit yeah and maybe think outside the box a little bit when things get tough try to mix it up and yeah and that's um you know that's one that's definitely a good one i think that uh, like we said before the, the gear thing is a great example of that i think a lot of the stuff that kelly you know developed you know back in the day was based on um some of the bass fishing right so that's something yeah. i would have never thought of but it makes sense yep and it works for these big fish i mean you gotta think that you know we're catching fish on uh certain plugs that are five or six inches long some of them are even longer than, bigger than that right so you know, guys are pulling out balance leeches a lot of the times that they're used to catching rainbow trout on. Uh, not going to cut it. You know, sometimes yeah. they work, but yeah. Uh, Is that the case? You know, when you think about kit, catching big fl- fish again, if you're tossing flies, I mean, are guys tossing gigantic? I mean, it, is it the big? I know the bigger isn't always the bigger fish, but do, 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 is there any truth to that at all? I don't think so. Yeah, um, yeah I you know some guys you, you, they'll catch a twenty pounder on a little tiny coronamid or yeah. you know catch a you know I caught a I caught a you know a small trout out here on a eight inch plug yesterday too. So yeah. I don't think that size necessarily matters, but they do key into certain things. Um, and if they're if they are keyed into a certain size minnow, and which is what your balance leech most of the time is duplicating. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of times out here where people don't fish big enough stuff. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you can hardly get a balance leech that's big enough, in my opinion. But. Yeah, yeah. And and there's a lot of, um, I mean, wind, right, is a, is a good thing out there because it's kind of bringing um, the food in, I guess. But it is also tough. Casting, is that an issue? Are you casting against the wind? It should be, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it, that's the other thing too. I mean, you don't need when the wind's blowing, you don't need to be very far away from your ladder to catch fish. So don't be intimidated. Mm. Um, learn to fish in the wind a little bit. Uh, you want it to be windy and you want the wind to be coming in to your ladder or at least across. If it's blowing away from you, um, it it move is usually the key. So a lot of times when we pick a spot for fly fishing, we don't even know where we're going until we see the lake. 
We see the lake. If there's waves yep. coming into a certain beach, that's where we go. That's where you go. That's where you go. Okay. And and then how do you choose where to put the ladder? How do you know how de- you know where that channel is and the depth and stuff? You just kind of walk out. Just okay. walk out slowly with your ladder. You know, just making sure you don't fall off that ledge, and you just get as as deep as you can. Set yep. it up. You know, you get up to about just below your nipples and set her up. No, no kidding. Climb up there. Yeah. So, so you set up as deep, and and you mentioned the the water is higher this year. So I'm just trying to get a picture of that ledge. So this is a, a like a bedrock ledge, or rock, I mean, and it that's not changing, right? So as water depth changes, does that affect the fishing? Yep, absolutely. It changed everything. Um, it, one, it and, and it's not always bedrock. There's there's rocks and boulders, but a lot of it's sand. It's almost all sand out to the shelf, and another sand drop, and and yeah, the water coming up has changed the dynamics of the lake considerably um, a place that used to be the most famous, uh, the most pressured piece of water called the South nets um, in the forever. As long as I've known, there's not even a, you can't even fly fish it now because the water, it's a big shallow kind of a flat. Um, and the ledge is so far out in the water now that the fly guys can't really even get to it. Yep. So that's unless it. you're in a boat. So, that's your boat. <laughs> so there are some places where you just can't, uh, yeah, depend on the water. So how? I mean, again, I'm just trying to think. So if somebody's going to be going up on their own, like we said, the guide is a great thing, you know, to get. But if you were on your own, you just kind of have to explore and kind of try to find that. I guess people are going to be fishing, yeah. right? You can see where people are fishing, right? You can see where people are. You can talk to people. Yeah. Get some. Get a map. Yeah. Um, and. You know, if you're if you're gonna go, don't be afraid to move around either. You know, get to a spot. You know, I see this. I saw this happening yesterday. There was a guy just posted up with binoculars, just watching some people. Mm-hmm. So either he was either he's not supposed to be within 300 feet of a school, or he was watching fly fishing. <laughs> <for, yeah. laughs> that's right. That's right. You never you never know. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Unless he had fly fishing stuff on his on the back of his truck, otherwise we'd have called the cops. I, I was gonna say the uh, <laughs> you know what they say. The funny thing is, is that you know even the uh, the ex cons the, the the criminals they love recreating too. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so there's definitely people out there that are like full on. They've done some crazy shit, and it doesn't mean <laughs> you know. I mean, you just gotta realize that. Yeah, no kidding. They're not all great sports. I always think that sportsmen are always the greatest people in the yep. in the country. I don't even lock my truck. But now, now you told me that. I better. It's true. Things. Well, I you know I've done some hunting too, and I mean it's funny when you leave you, you got you leave your camp wide open, right? I mean you got all oh, this yeah. stuff just to be anybody can go in there. <laughs> but you know what it is? I think what it is is when you're out there, even the criminals for the most part, it's like a different place. You know what I mean? Like they yep. just know camping, fishing, you know, you just don't do that out there. It's, it's kind of, I don't know. I, I, that's my guess. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're onto something. I've never had a problem. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. So, well, I think we've dug into a little bit on, you know, I mean, we've just touched the surface. I'm sure there's probably like, we go so deep and I think maybe digging into the Reno, um, shop and, and all that would be a good place to start and maybe who knows maybe i'll get mike or somebody else on to, to talk about some other things and dig in a little bit deeper i mean today i really want to just touch the surface because i did want to hit on the giveaway i wanted to give everybody an opportunity to promote that and and kind of um and talk a little bit about that so can you you know we were also not only are we doing this trip to um to pyramid but we're going to be giving away some products can you talk about the products the companies you work with and maybe some of the products we're going to be giving away as part of this big uh, blast yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, without the sponsors and without our products, and none of this stuff ever works out or ever happens. So, of course, I mean, you know, and over the years, I've been able to align with some of the the products and the and the companies that I and we mesh well with. Right? They're um, they're just great people. You know, we get to know the owners of these companies and the people behind the scenes, and um, and so that's kind of the companies that we work with are always, in my opinion, are the 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 best of the best Mm -hmm. um so we're going to be giving away products every three days i think is what we decided right i think so a lot of people on board so monarch fly lines is one of them um they they're a company i've got to know really well uh monarch fly lines is out of colorado american made company um very cool different concept of fly lines check them out okay um they're environmentally friendly um i don't know if anybody out there, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people know about fly lines, but uh, what I didn't know is there's a lot of fly lines. The, most of the fly lines, the coatings and the stuff that's used to make them mm-hmm. uh, are terrible for the um, 
you know, the EPA standards are really? terrible, 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 terrible. And that's why huh. you, you, you probably noticed that the fly lines have changed a lot in the last few years with, you know, the coatings rubbing off and they crack a little earlier and break down sooner than you think. And that's because the EPA was changing, the, you know, what's allowed because some of that stuff is so nasty for the environment. Um, but anyway, they are a very cool company. They got great lines, and they're eco-friendly, mm-hmm. and they cast great, and they last for a while. So uh, somebody else, Adams Built Fishing, um, they have a, a lot of good wait, you know, waders and boots and rods and reels and all kinds of stuff. Uh, we'll be giving some of their stuff away. Mm-hmm. Glacier Glove, same thing, just great company. Uh, good sun protection gloves as well as they actually – designed the first neoprene glove uh for pyramid lake that's kind of where hmm. they started here in reno so mm-hmm. that's kind of a cool tie-in yep that's uh and i think that's the cool thing is that you know a lot of the you know i think an adams build is pretty local right they're they're in your area yeah they're in my office <laughs> yeah oh there yeah, yeah that's right because you're yeah yeah, you're, yep, you, yeah you i got actually have had a lot of uh input on the design um you know, we work on the stuff all the time with Adams yep. Built. That's right. Yeah, I remember. Great. I remember when I met, or I just talked to him. I did meet him actually. I met him at uh, I think it was IFTD, as you know, back uh, this year, last year. But yeah, we we met before that, just talking, and um, yeah, it, it was cool. That was the awesome thing when I first connected to you is that that you had that connection, and I already kind of made. You know, it's a small world, obviously, so it, you know yeah. it, it makes sense. But cool. So that gives us a little perspective. We got some other products. I'll put um, I'll put a link to the giveaway and some of the other stuff we're doing you know, as part of it, um, before we, you know, get into the rapid fire round here to kind of wrap this thing up, did you have, you know, just on fishing, anything else you want to toss out there? I guess, you know, the resources is, is I think maybe the one thing it sounds like there isn't necessarily a pyramid lake, uh, fly fish or, you know, fishing book or anything like that, but you know, probably YouTube and just your general stuff. Yeah, go search lots, it up. Yeah. Lots of YouTube stuff, lots of how to stuff, do some research. It's, it's fairly simple, honestly. So, yeah, so I'm looking at, I just did my Google search and I've got, um, you know, pyramidlakeflyfishing.com comes up a lot, pyramidflyco.com, uh, sage flyfish, pyramid lake, perfect setup. So there, yeah, there's definitely sage, um, five, five things I'm glad I, I did at Pyramid Lake from Orvis, you know, so, you know, this is, right. you know, you got the big companies out there. And so here's a question for you on the companies and I've been, you know, as I'm getting this, you you got 12 years in, you're you're quite a far ahead of me in in the industry stuff, and I know you kind of do both. You know, it's interesting because you think of some of the bigger companies, like we said, the Sage, the Orvis, um, you know, Sims, all those stuff. Have you tried to you know reach out to those bigger companies and you know, kind of for promotional sponsorships and stuff, or is that something that's just harder to to connect with them since they're at this higher level? Yeah, it's it's tough. Um, you know, Orvis, Patagonia. Yep. sage sims um you know they have their guys yeah it's it's tough um and they you know they have you know i'm not i'm not their league i guess you're either, not maybe. well you're not an insider right you're you're kind of doing right. a little bit of both and, right and i know like i i did a whole show on the delta with john uh john sherman from sims mm-hmm. um one of their reps and one of their head guys or whatever um so i mean i i know the guys and stuff but yeah um, you know, when you already, when you align yourself, one of the things that I've been really, I really try hard with my show is to align myself with good companies that I can back and talk about and help promote for the long term. You know, I don't want, I don't want the fans of my show to be seeing me telling, telling them like, Hey, this Adams built stuff is great. You know, it's the best. It's great. And then the next year saying, Oh, my new Orvis is the best. And then <laughs> the next year, Oh, Sims is the best, yeah. you know, which happens a lot. And yeah. it's, phony you know it's not real and yep you know i've tried to align myself with these brands that i know that i can get behind you know sometimes it doesn't work out but most of the time i've been with these companies for almost as long as i've been doing it glacier glove has one of my was one of my first sponsors ever that's cool that's cool no it makes total sense in fact that you know, um, I do a little promotional stuff here, and uh, I mean, I guess affiliate marketing is some of the, the technical term, which is a, you know kind of a little bit of a spammy term, but it, it makes sense, you know. And when I got into thinking about which rod I was going to, you know, promote and say, hey, here's the rod that I I think you should get if you need a rod, especially if you're starting out. Um, you know, Echo is is the rod that I recommend, and it's you know it's a great company. It's you know they they got a great warranty. They're just you know amazing you know and all this stuff. But they're not the highest end. You know they they don't you know they don't cost as much as a sage. And you know, I think that's the good thing. But 
the the thing that I don't do is say, you know, here get this rod from Echo and also get this rod from Sage and you know what I mean because right. it just muddies the water. You know, people they don't if they want a rod, you know, tell them what rod you recommend. Don't tell them 10 rods. Yeah, exactly. So. And and all, you know, we there's a lot of good product out there now. And like you said, Echo Echo makes a great rod and mm-hmm. they're great dudes. Like Tim and I know a lot of the same people. Oh, cool. Um you know, the Jurassic Lake guys, oh, the yeah. Golden Dorado fishery down there. In fact, I'm going to SCI here in a few hours to go have lunch with Luciano, who owns Jurassic Lake Lodge and the, oh, right. not Jurassic Lake Lodge, it's Estancia Laguna Verde on Jurassic Lake. But, um, and then he owns the, the Golden Dorado River Cruiser as well. Oh, cool. And I know Tim knows them guys. Too, what's, so. what's SCI? Uh, Safari Club International. So, uh, mostly big game kind of hunting stuff, but it's in Reno, and okay. a lot of my fishing, a lot of my fishing guys are there. Oh, cool! All right. Well, hey, yeah, Dennis, I mean, I think definitely we left probably some stuff on the table from from the fishing tips and tricks stuff. So I, I definitely, you know, maybe later on, I, I talk about this. The more that I do this, the more I say, you know, let's get the the next episode on you. So if you could come <laughs> back, maybe after we do this trip and stuff, we'll we'll get you and Brian back on, and we'll do like a wrap up and talk, you know, about how the tr- the giveaway and the trip went. And that that might be a cool way to do it. Yeah, and then we could maybe talk about what di- what we dialed in that you know those three or four days. Yeah, you know, this is what worked. So yeah, yeah, specifically, this, you know, this would be fun. Yeah, I think this giveaway is going to be amazing. I mean, basically, the person gets this trip. You know, they they get a stay. You know, in uh, in a lodge, and they get a get guided by obviously you have you grew up there it's so it's a good thing let's let's wrap it up here with a quick little rapid fire round. I just got some quick little questions. Some are kind of random. Some are not so random. And then we'll get out of here. You got it. So, um, first on, you know, back to the show, Wild Fish, Wild Places, do you know which episode is your most popular episode? I do not. Um, I don't. Okay. I, and if, if you don't, the next question would be, what is your favorite episode? Or what's the one, you know, would you think about, like, if you had to, like, send one person that who's never watched it to an episode, which one would it be? Uh, season six, uh, the first episode of the season, Vampire Fish. Yeah. Uh, that. That was my favorite episode. I think maybe we've ever done. Really, <laughs> just because the vampire fish are such a cool fish, and it was one of the things. But we are going to Africa in October, so that oh wow, my trumpet. <laughs> no kidding. What? Where? where what's the Africa trip? Uh, tiger fish, Namibia. There you go. There you go. So I heard a little bit about. I think it might have been on another podcast where you were talking about just some of the trips and how things don't always go as planned. I mean, you're you're doing these trips to these remote places and I can imagine you go to a lodge, right? Things are pretty much stuff can still go wrong, but for the most part, you're going into like doing like DIY almost stuff, right? Is that, can you talk a little bit about maybe, I mean, have you ever been close to death or is there any trips, you know what I mean? It's been kind of crazy. What what would you say if you had to tell somebody that the craziest trip that you've, you've had out there? Oh man, there's, there's a lot of different uh, depths and rabbit holes. We could go down that. Um, I actually, we early on in our, career we actually got uh we were in uruguay we were fishing brazil and we ended up in uruguay and kind of got held hostage for footage um mm. by this guy would my producer wasn't giving him the footage he wanted it was they basically held us captive for six hours and Jeez. yeah it was it was a little sketchy man and yep. you know um that and um we got into a little beef in Colombia on the border of Venezuela with some local fishermen and that was touch and go for a little while. Yeah, it was it was a little scary. No kidding. Yeah. That's uh yeah, well we'll uh, I'll put um maybe I'll find a couple of episodes that that I like and throw them in the show notes so we can Well, and I guess if they want to watch these are, do they have to is there are there any things that are free out there so I could just click through and watch what you have? There is a lot of promotional promo videos. You can type in Wild Fish Wild Places. Uh, mm-hmm. pr- you know, th- you'll see a lot of promo videos for other oh, companies okay. that we've done and stuff. But uh, stay tuned. Within the next uh, 20, 30 days, the new YouTube page will be launched. Um, so you can go to Wild Fish Wild Places YouTube page. Oh, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. How does that work now? So, so basically, you have this TV, um, the um, the World Fishing Network, right? Who right. I guess owns the rights to some of your shows. How does that work on YouTube? Can you start? promoting your old stuff or what's your plan there they never own it outright they have an exclusivity for the first year um so we go to the network for the first year and then we go to amazon and 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 i own everything so i can put it out wherever i want oh really so you can actually put you can put everything out on youtube if you wanted to 
Yep, and that's what I'm doing. I'm just breaking it up into segments so yeah. it's not as long for people to watch. That's a great idea. Uh, you know, I'm not a big YouTube. I mean, I obviously, I love YouTube, but I don't do a lot of stuff on YouTube. But um, I did talk to Colin um, with the new Fly Fisher, and he's got, uh-huh. I think he's got, I want to say, 80,000 subscribers and he it's just fly fishing right it's it's all fly wow. fishing that's fantastic i know and that's what he was he was talking about we dug in a little bit too about the youtube like how he got there and he was talking about a little bit but you know it's interesting like you know that's the amazing thing about youtube because that's what he talked about he was on um you know he's got a tv show that's been on op- uh, npr right for for years it's been the longest running i think fly fishing tv show but eventually he was like man youtube right he got into it back whenever that was and YouTube is what, you know, that's like, I think that's the business. Yeah. Yeah. So I think so. It seems perfect for you. I mean, it just seems like you've got a TV show. It seems like if you could uh, align your stuff right, it seems like you could have a crazy success with YouTube. Yeah. I hope so. I hope, uh, I, I really hope it is um, successful. We are top 70% um, on Amazon Prime. So oh, really? I know, yeah. I know people, I know it's getting out there. I know people are really enjoying it, getting a lot of messages out there. Oh, cool. And, so yeah, I think I think your viewers will love it. That's a good that's a good point. So on that line, how do you know you do your shows, you produce them, you've got people obviously. How, how do you know when you're, you know, either kind of doing good or, or you know not to, you know, how do you get that feedback? How's all that work? You know, it it's it is tough to tell because you know, you don't have Nielsen ratings or anything like that, and those mm-hmm. are tough anyway, but um <laughs> you know, running into people. I mean, that's a perfect example. Getting messages. Um we did a steelhead episode where, um, you know, we dropped a steelhead, you know, and on the sea tuck, oh, we wow. dropped it. Yeah. I mean, it happens, right? Yeah, it does. It does. And I left it in the show yep. um, because it's real. Like, that's one thing about Wild Fish Wild Places. You're not going to see any BS. Um, it's fun, but it's 100% real. If we lose fish, if we do not catch fish, we tell you. And that's the way it's been from day one. And I got a whole story. We can go into that, but I won't. <laughs> um, from day one. If we don't catch fish, we tell the viewers we're not catching fish, and we want to know why, and we try to figure out why, and mm-hmm. we never we never BS that. And same thing with that, you know. Yep. You drop fish, you know. I I don't try to mishandle fish. I I care for fish. We use single barbless, and mm-hmm. anyway, we dropped a fish, and man, I tell you what, my freaking phone and email blew up. No when kidding. Those things went to air, yeah, which is good. You know, people care guys were pissed you know and chewing my butt yeah whatever it's okay and and uh and then getting recognized you know that's the other thing you know you're getting out there when you know i had a guy we were in Kauai a couple of years ago walk out of a shop and said hey you're dennis from wild fish wild places right and you know you're like what <laughs> yeah <laughs> you get somebody messing with me you there know? you go so anyway that's kind of how we judge it lots of feedback and then obviously amazon we can track it yeah you can track it yeah so you can see your growth on amazon yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. No. That that, that get, it sheds a little insight on that. Um, and so, what about so you? Uh, so, sports. Did you play any? Um, you know, what was your main sport? Did you do any sports in high school and all that stuff throughout your life? Uh, high high school. I started playing football as a freshman. Um, I got sacked by my own team. You know, on a scrimmage, dislocated, fractured my shoulder, and I almost missed the opener of chucker hunting season. <laughs> And I never played football again. Because there you go. <laughs> hunting is way more important. But I actually did golf. I golfed a lot from when I was 10 okay. until I was 18. I actually had a scholarship to UNR, a small scholarship if I wanted to play. Oh, cool. But I didn't, I didn't want to go to school. So I said, no, thanks. So there you go. So, yeah. So <laughs> golf, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And uh, I, I've done played a little golf myself. It's definitely not an easy sport. A little a little bit easier on the body than, than uh, football for sure. And that's the thing that I, I've I love about it uh, at this point. I mean, I see all my friends that are my age and younger going in for knee replacements and hip surgeries and all this stuff yep. already. It's like, man, I still feel great. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's golf. Yeah. So you've been, it sounds like, I mean, you've been a lifelong, I mean, hunting, fishing your whole life. Sounds like my whole, my whole life, man. Yep. I, I literally went on my first fishing trip with my grandparents when I was a year old, you know, obviously I didn't fish. I just, my grandma took me as a baby, obviously to go camping and yeah. And, uh, yeah, I've been, uh, I have been in love with the outdoors. I, my whole life has been 
juggled around to accommodate the most hunting and fishing I could do ever. Yeah, that's it. And you've, you've you managed to change your whole life. I mean, it's pretty much the show, and we haven't dug into some of your products and stuff. But you're you're pretty much that. This is your main source of income is the show, the products you it sell, is. and all that. It is, you know, and I have Amazing. some other businesses. Um, you know, we don't have to go into that. I have yeah. storage shed facilities and manufacturing businesses, and you know, other things. But this is my main source of income. There you yes. go. That's amazing. Uh, th- again, that's one of the things we occasionally talk about here is to hear the stories because, you know, it, it's not always easy in the fishing, you know, f- fly fishing industry to, you know, to make a, a full time living on it. So um, it's tough. Yeah, yeah, it's really tough. That's cool. All right. Uh, one last one before we get out of here. So uh, music, are you more, um, do you listen to more music kind of or, or podcast? What's your what music? You, music. Okay. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a metal guy, man. Cool. <laughs> G- give me a band. Right. Give me a band. Something I can throw in the show notes. Some some uh, D- disturbed. Godsmack. Dis- oh, Godsmack. ACDC. Yeah. There yeah. you go. There you go. All right. <laughs> All right, Dennis. I uh, we're about there. Hey, in the next uh, six uh, to twelve months or so, any anything new coming up for you? Want to let us know? Yeah, I just tell the tell everybody listening to just stay stay up on the social and uh, stay you know check the YouTube stuff out. Uh, but yeah, we're we're getting ready to roll with uh, season eleven. So we are going to be out and about, um, yeah, heading down to Argentina to go Golden Dorado fishing and duck hunting. Um, we'll be in the Yukon chasing pike and, you know, grayling and stuff. Alaska, doing a float trip in Alaska, nice. Africa. So, yeah, just, just stay up with us. we got some cool stuff coming down the pipe. That's cool. That's cool. And I'll put a link at um, wetflyswing.com slash giveaway. That'll be a, a link to uh, so people can – yeah, jump into that i think i'm going to post this uh just before it ends so there'll still be time to get in on it and uh so uh and if they want to find you it's just a wildfishwildplaces.com yep all the contact info there and then, of course on social dennis is bister d-e-n-i-s uh dennis with one n is bister uh you can find me there and and uh yeah check it out nice nice all right dennis hey thanks for coming on and uh shedding some light on pyramid i think uh you know, probably a lot of people have, have heard of it, uh, but I'm sure a lot of people haven't fished it yet. So I'm uh, we'll, we'll be sharing it when we get out there and do the trip. We'll, we'll let some, maybe get some photos, some big fish. And yeah, man, we'll put it out there now, right? We got a chance legitimately at a 20-pound cutthroat, which just seems crazy. It is crazy, and it's uh, it's a blast. Looking forward to the winners coming with us. We're going to have a really good time. All right, man. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks. All right, see ya. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway. That's G-I-V-E-A-W-A-Y. If you want to enter the big trip to Pyramid Lake, just head over to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway. Like I just said, Um, lots of additional products. Uh, There should be a couple still left here that you can win, even if you don't win the big trip. And I think we even have a second price, uh, second place uh, winner going to another fishing destination that we'll be talking about there. I just want to thank you again for stopping by to check out the show today. Hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. 